2022 is coming to a close. Many games released this year, most of them to fairly positive reception. I'm making this video as a wrap up of my own year in gaming and talking about all of the games that I played. Some of them, of course, released this year, but many of them released in previous years that I'm just now getting around to. So this is going to be more of an unscripted video where I review each one in very short clips. This is more of a mini review rather than a whole full review because there's just so many games that I played this year. If I remember, it's around 50 or so. And so I did want to go through each game relatively quickly. There won't be any spoilers for any of these, I just wanted to quickly go over my thoughts on each game that I played, and without further ado, let's get started. I'm going to first go over every game that actually released this year, and talk about my experiences with them, and then I'll get into games that released in previous years, and then after that, I'll get into games that I started but either haven't finished or decided to drop partway through. So first up, releasing very early on in the year, is Pokemon Legends Arceus, or Arceus depending on how you pronounce it. I kind of switch between the two pronunciations. This game set out to revolutionize Pokemon and make it more of a true 3D open world experience, building on what Sword and Shield started with the wild areas. Pokemon Legends Arceus, it introduced some great mechanics like throwing balls to catch Pokemon in real time rather than going into a battle, and some stealth mechanics, and during battle you can switch attack types to get extra moves but do less damage, or get less moves but do more damage. And so this brought a good amount of variety and ingenuity to Pokemon that hasn't been seen in quite a long time. And that's honestly great, I enjoy that aspect of it, but where Pokemon Legends Arceus really failed for me was its world and exploration. Setting out to be more of an open world, open area type game, its level design really didn't capture me and oftentimes it felt very bland and uninspired. Just empty, really. There was nothing to do in the world besides catch some Pokemon, and the world itself wasn't pleasing to look at either. Seriously, the Switch is behind in power a lot, I know, but there are games that look much better than this on the system. So I know it's not exactly the Switch's fault, more so the crunch time that the company likely had when making the game. Overall, Legends Arceus was alright. I liked some of the mechanics that it brought to the table. I liked how you had to research Pokemon in order to get Pokedex entries. I thought that was great. The story was admittedly not very good. It was very bland. It was just not interesting. I did not enjoy it very much. However, when I was out in the world just catching Pokemon, I had some fun with it. Overall, the game wasn't bad, but I can't see myself revisiting it or really thinking about it much anytime soon. Kirby and the Forgotten Land released not too long after, and this was Kirby's first time being in 3D. True 3D, that is. It's not a spin-off game on the 3DS, and it's not a 2D platformer on the N64. No, this is true 3D Kirby. And they pulled it off. They did it. They breathed some new life into Kirby that wasn't there in previous games like Star Allies. This is what Kirby should be in modern day. It it works so extremely well, and all of the presentation is just so charming and gorgeous. I love the music, I love the world, the characters are fun, I really had a good time with this game. 
it's not, you know, the best thing ever, but for what it is, it was very enjoyable. I really liked Kirby and the Forgotten Land. Next is surprisingly one of the more ambitious games that released this year. And it's not what you might think it is. It's LEGO Star Wars The Skywalker Saga. It aimed to remake all nine LEGO Star Wars games, which is an incredibly big undertaking and had to be delayed a few times if I remember correctly, but it finally released this year and it's pretty good. They had a lot of big expectations from numerous LEGO Star Wars fans who grew up with it in their childhood, including myself, and overall they did a very good job appealing to those fans. Some of that magic isn't quite there and some of the levels are of course stripped down a lot compared to the originals just because the scope of this game is so much larger. I wish some of the areas were a bit more fleshed out and especially them good. The combat was fun and the collectibles were numerous. There were so many of them and they really did just capture that great Lego Star Wars aesthetic. And they knew how to do it well too. The humor was on point and there was a mumble mode that allowed the game to be just like the original with its voice acting which I really, really appreciate. I had fun with this game. It wasn't exactly what I was expecting it to be, but it was still good, and I really enjoyed it. Another remake that released this year was the Stanley Parable Ultra Deluxe. This was actually my first time playing the Stanley Parable at all. I never played it originally, and it was alright. It it didn't hit me quite as hard as other games that I played this year, or as hard as it did for others, and that's okay, it's just not exactly my type of game. It was funny, and it was interesting, but it just didn't leave a very big impression on me. There were a lot of good jokes and bits, but overall, it didn't feel super satisfying. Next up is another game that released this year, which is Power Wash Simulator. I know it's a goofy title, but it's exactly what it sounds like, simulating the act of power washing in a video game. And of course, power washing is something that I've done in my life before, so I have experience, and I can say that it's somewhat accurate, um, and it's fun and therapeutic, really. I like kicking back with it on an evening while I watch a Twitch stream or YouTube video and just playing some Power Wash Sim. It's fun and enjoyable and there isn't a ton to it, but it serves its purpose. What else can I say? I'm going to try not to go off on a tangent here, I promise. I'll save it for a later video, but the next game that released is easily the most excited I was for a game this year. The lead up to release was so much fun and I had a lot of good memories waiting for this game to come out. Of course, if you've watched my channel, you probably know I'm talking about I the Somnium Files Nirvana Initiative, the sequel to I the Somnium Files, and I really really liked this game, which is actually an understatement because Nirvana Initiative has become my favorite game of all time, and <laughs> I've thought about it a lot. I've done some real deep reflection, and I do love this game for all that it is, really. I could go off about every single aspect about it and why I love it so much. I love the new characters, I love the music, the whole aesthetic and visuals are so unique and interesting and some of my favorite ever. 
the whole story is top notch. The pacing is incredible. It's it's all just great here, and it delivered in every aspect of selling what it meant to be, and I really, really liked it. I really did. The next game that released this year, and I don't mean to bring down the mood, but I really didn't enjoy it, and I know a lot of people will disagree seeing as this game was nominated for Game of the Year, but this game is Stray, and Stray has a lot of issues. It has some good things going for it. I love being able to play as a cat, and it's not a human who is possessing a cat in any form. It's just a cat. It does cat things, and I love that. I love cats so much. This game did speak to me on that aspect. But on the other hand, the gameplay was not very good. There wasn't really platforming, seeing as whenever you would go up to a platform, there would just be a button prompt that would automatically get you onto that platform. There's enemies, occasionally, that you have to either run away from or eventually fight, but neither of those sections are very good. The characters aren't very memorable, the story wasn't that great either, and the world felt kinda generic at times. And then, before it got good, Stray ended. So. This game really left me with a feeling of emptiness, but not in an interesting or good way. It just felt bland and uninspired, and I wish it could have been better, but I did not enjoy this game, and seeing it nominated for Game of the Year makes me so confused and concerned because I don't think this game was very good, and looking past the cute cat game aesthetic, What's here just didn't do it for me. The next game that came out, which I actually did enjoy a lot, was Xenoblade Chronicles 3. And I was surprised by how much I enjoyed this game. The cast was fantastic, top notch. I loved all of these characters so much, their chemistry with one another was great. The voice acting really sold it, and everyone's performances were just top notch. The gameplay was so much fun. I loved the job system, everything was so refined, I really really liked the combat this time around, and the exploration was pretty good too. The world wasn't as unique or interesting as Xenoblade Chronicles 2, as with the music in my opinion, which also was not as strong this time around, but the tracks that were good were stellar. I can't even say enough how great some of these tracks are. Some of the fights are great. I really, really enjoyed this game. It can lag sometimes, not in the actual game aspect, but in the story aspect, things can just drag on a bit, and occasionally it just feels like nothing's happening. But those moments of payoff are fantastic. Specifically, the end of chapter 5, which if you know what I'm talking about, you know what I'm talking about, was just such an incredible video game moment this year. One of my absolute, absolute favorites. The ending was a little unsatisfying in some areas, but I very much enjoyed the final boss, and everything wrapped up neatly. I can't wait to see what the DLC for this game will be. I'm excited to continue playing. Overall, Xenoblade Chronicles 3 was a very, very good game. One that I will definitely remember for a long time. Later this year, completely out of nowhere, Nintendo dropped Kirby's Dream Buffet, which is such an odd release. It, it's very cheap, it's just an eShop game, and it's 
kind of a multiplayer Fall Guys type game. There's some battle royale elements. There's some mini game elements. It's overall just a weird release. It was fun and I enjoyed it. It didn't hold my attention for too long. I only played it for a couple of hours. But it was fun. I love the charm that Kirby games always have. There were tons of great references, music, everything. And overall, it's fine for the small price that it had. I really couldn't say anything more about it because it just kind of exists. And I honestly forgot that it exists for a good chunk of time. And it was just kind of a filler title. But it's not bad by any means. I enjoyed the time that I had with it. And that brings us to the last game that released this year that I fully, thoroughly played. And that game is Splatoon 3. And I love this game. <laughs> I was a big fan of Splatoon 2 and even Splatoon 1. So Splatoon 3 being out was just kind of a dream come true. Some aspects aren't the strongest, but overall I love Splatoon 3 and I'm going to keep playing it all the time. All the time. I already have 80 something hours logged on it and I'm easily going to get more seeing as I got around 400 in Splatoon 2. The single player campaign is much stronger than the first and second games, and it's very similar to Opto Expansion from Splatoon 2. In some ways, almost a little too similar to it, and I wish Splatoon 3 could have done some more of its own things with its own ideas, but it was fun all the way through. It was just a blast. I loved the levels. The music is fantastic. Everything about this game is great. Everything is so refined, I love the new movement options, the new maps are fun, and I can't wait to see the support that this game will get with updates and Splatfests and everything to come. This was honestly such a great experience for me this year, and Splatoon has always been a big part of my life, but Splatoon 3 was really something special. And those are all the games I played extensively that released this year. However, most of the games I played this year didn't release in 2022, rather released previously. And those are the ones that I'm going to talk about now. First up is the Xenoblade Chronicles series. I'll go through each one. Xenoblade 1, which by the way, I played Definitive Edition on the Switch, I did not play the Wii version or the 3DS version. It was good. I didn't love it as much as other people did, but I did not dislike it by any means. The game served a good purpose. Um, the gameplay was fine. I wouldn't say it was great, but it was fine. The areas in the game were beautiful. Uh, the story was good, but had some flaws. A lot of the story felt like just kind of a generic JRPG adventure, which is fine, but overall, it didn't leave a ton of impact on me, and a lot of scenes <laughs> I actually forgot, and the game was a bit forgettable to me. Again, not bad by any means, I enjoyed it, but it didn't impact me as much as others. And of course after that is Xenoblade Chronicles 2. I skipped over X, I still have yet to play that, but I do have it downloaded and installed on my Wii U ready to go. But Xenoblade 2 on the other hand was just alright. I have mixed feelings on it because the gameplay was introduced terribly. The tutorials were not good at teaching the player the basics of the game, and 
I spent a majority of the game incredibly confused about how the entire thing worked, which wasn't a very pleasant experience. Many of the characters did not do much for me. Some were great, some were really not. I did not like Rex, the protagonist. I didn't really like his blades. I liked some of the side characters though. And the story was good. The area the areas and music were all great. I mean, seriously, the music is fantastic. But man, I can't get over that gameplay. And some of the fan service y type stuff it just did not sit right with me. And on top of that, there were some gotcha mechanics forced into the game that you had to interact with in order to progress at all, which was incredibly infuriating and was an aspect that I did not enjoy. So, Xenoblade Chronicles 2 is a bit of a mixed bag, but it's alright, it's not the worst thing in the world. And then, to expand on Xenoblade Chronicles 2, there was a prequel released called Torna that is also pretty good. Um, I love the characters, the gameplay is incredibly refined and fun, the tutorials did a great job at explaining everything, and I enjoyed a lot of it. It was a good, tight, compact experience, really. But there's one major flaw that keeps me from loving Torna, and that is the community system. See, it only comes up twice, but there is a system that essentially forces you to complete a majority of side quests in the game to progress at all, and it really bogged down the experience. It slowed everything to a halt, and made me grind through a bunch of side quests I had no real motivation to do, other than to beat the game. It kind of soiled the whole experience, and I wish, I wish I loved Torna, but that feature just makes me really not like it as much as others. Another series that I played through this year was the Halo series. Now, I only played the Bungie games, meaning 1, 2, 3, and then ODST and Reach. I did not play Halo 4, Halo 5, or Halo Infinite, but the games that I did play were all very good. So, starting off with Halo 1, rather known as Halo Combat Evolved, it's a very, very good start, and really redefined first-person shooters in general. Many of the missions are really memorable, and the locations really sold it. Just the overall atmosphere that Halo CE had was great. I mean, it was, it was definitely a lot of fun. And I played through the entire series with a friend of mine, which really helped a lot. I had so much more fun than I would have had playing it alone, and if any of you one day intend to play the Halo series, I can't recommend playing it with a friend enough. But back to Halo CE, it has some problems. Um, halfway through the game, a new type of enemy is introduced called the Flood, and from there, it can get a bit frustrating just dealing with them. Um, it could be kind of annoying, especially the library mission uh, <laughs> is lives on in infamy, but the second half of the game definitely took a bit of a turn for the worse in some areas. The ending was great. It's an absolute certified classic. I would probably replay it if I had the chance. And Halo 2 refined the entire experience and added to it as well. There are new missions where you play as the Arbiter, a new character, and 
those missions are so much fun. I love how the entire UI is recolored, and I love how he plays, and it's just so much fun. I love all of the locations. Again, the story is really, really good, and it's a great setup for the third and final game. And one more thing that I need to mention about Halo 2 is that the music is still great, as with the entire series is, but specifically, obviously, Blow Me Away by Breaking Benjamin is great. It is a fantastic song. Um, I really, really enjoyed it. I loved Halo 2. And Halo 3 was even better. It was a fantastic conclusion to the series. So much fun. The gameplay was amazing. I loved every second of it. The scarabs, all of the different vehicles, all of the different weapons. I loved it so, so much. Especially playing with a friend. I really enjoyed Halo 3. And the story really had such an epic conclusion here. I loved it. It was great. I have a lot of love for the Halo series, and I really liked it. And then Halo 3 ODST, probably the least favorite of the Halo games that I played, but still somewhat solid. It's the shortest one, I believe, and follows the ODST squad on Earth. And it's a good showcase for a lot of different gameplay features, but overall, it didn't leave me with a lot of impact. It was just fine overall. And finally, Halo Reach. This is my favorite Halo game. I think the story was just so incredibly, incredibly solid as really just a prequel to it all, and it was a really heart-wrenching character-driven story that left with a really emotional ending that has stuck with me throughout time. And Halo Reach also had very fun gameplay, and its Forge mode is great. I've played so much uh, Forge with friends, and I loved playing through this whole series this year. It's a very special memory that I have, and nothing else will really come close to the multiplayer memories that I have of this game. Continuing with the FPS genre, last year I played Doom 2016, a fantastic reboot of the series that was well needed. I loved it a lot, but this year I played Doom Eternal, and Doom Eternal really just bolstered everything that 2016 started. The weapons all went so well with each other. Every enemy had some sort of weakness or strategy to go about killing it, and it was a lot of fun to play. The movement especially was great this time around. I loved moving around the maps and battling all sorts of different demons. I had a lot of fun with this. The story was alright. Um, it was good. Doom's stories are never the best or the most interesting things ever, but it serves its purpose well enough to create an atmosphere and setting for the game to take place in, which, by the way, the setting this time around is much, much better, or rather, settings, plural, because everything is so much more varied than in Doom 2016, which that game had a lot of Mars and laboratories, whereas this game has all sorts of different areas in terms of alternate worlds and jungled temples and snow bases, all sorts of different things. I really enjoyed all of the different variety that Doom Eternal had. I enjoyed it a lot. 
and along with Doom Eternal, I played both of its DLCs, The Ancient Gods, which were also very good. I think the missions were a little too long in some areas, they just kind of dragged on a bit, um, but the theming was still great on point, and the gameplay was a lot of fun. The story wrapped up nicely, and I had a lot of fun with Doom Eternal. Another FPS game that I played this year was Ultra Kill, and Ultra Kill is a very fun game. It's actually not finished yet, it's still in early access, and only a small portion of the game is finished, that being Acts 1 and 2, which I played both of, and it was a very enjoyable experience all the way through. There's a lot of unique personality and interesting concepts here that I really enjoy. It uses a lot of aspects from the Devil May Cry series, but retools them in a first-person shooter perspective. It works really well, and I honestly enjoy a lot of it. It was challenging and fun, really. It, it was fast-paced, the movement was quick and snappy, and the story is just alright. But really, it's about that gameplay, and it's about that gunplay, really. I enjoyed it a lot, and I can't wait for Ultra Kill to be more developed and have more content, because I can't recommend playing this game enough and supporting it as a game. Now, this is a game you could consider an FPS, but not really the S part of it, because it's not a shooter. And this game is Ghost Runner. Ghost Runner is a first person slasher or sword game. Um, and you slow down time, you do tons of different crazy moves throughout so many different maps with tons of abilities. I had a lot of fun with it. Overall, it didn't really stick with me as a game and as an experience, really, but it was strong and it was fun. It was challenging, of course, and overcoming those challenges was very rewarding. It's kind of a mix of a ton of different games, namely Katana Zero, Cyberpunk, Doom, Celeste, maybe. It's really just its own unique game, and I do commend that a lot. I don't see many first-person sword games, especially ones like this, and for all of its creative ideas, I really have to applaud it for all of that. I enjoyed Ghost Runner a good amount, and although it didn't really stick with me, I recommend it. Another game I played with lots of sword play was No More Heroes, and there was a lot of hype surrounding this game that I had heard about, so I had high expectations going in, and I don't exactly think those expectations lived up to what I played. No More Heroes is not bad by any means, I honestly enjoyed a lot of my time with it, but some of the bosses and story beats were somewhat forgettable to me, and the gameplay was not as fun as I would hope it to be. I had played a lot of other action games this year, as you'll later learn, and No More Heroes just didn't do it for me. One compliment that I can give the game is that the art style and music were fantastic. I loved the presentation. I really liked a lot of the characters too, especially Travis, who has his own entire story, and I love him a lot. But overall, the core of this game didn't really strike me as hard as I was expecting it to. Along with No More Heroes 1, I also played No More Heroes 2, Desperate Struggle. This game is easily the more contentious of the two, and I will admit, I did not enjoy it as much. The storytelling was not nearly as strong, and I didn't find Travis to be a very interesting character. The gameplay was alright, and 
some of the bosses were alright, but a lot of them were a bit annoying, and the removal of exploring the overworld and doing some mini-games for money, it just did not feel the same as the first, and the removal of lots of things that made that first game so charming really bogged this one down a lot. I did not enjoy it as much, and I don't know if I'm going to continue the series, but I might one day. Another set of two games that I played this year was two indie RPGs known as the Hylix Duology. Introduced to me by a good friend of mine, I enjoyed my time with these games, although they could be a bit confusing and difficult to initially get into. Hylix 1 is a quaint little RPG Maker game. It's very short, but it is very surreal and unique in how it presents its story, its themes, its characters, and especially its art direction. Most of the text in the game is completely randomly generated, and it can be confusing and feel like it doesn't have much of a story, which is kind of true, but that adds to a lot of the charm that the game has. The RPG elements are just alright, they're not super deep or interesting, but they serve the game well. Overall, Hylix was a fun experience, and then its second game was a much more refined and high budget, really, experience. Where the second game really shined was how it took the art direction of the first game, translated it into 3D, while still maintaining what made that first game so special. The music in the second game immediately got a huge upgrade and is as fantastic as ever. The story is a bit more set in stone as well, and I really enjoyed both of these games. They're so much fun, and I can't wait for the third game. Please go give this developer some support. I loved the Hylix duology. Another indie game that I played this year is Katana Zero. And Katana Zero was such a memorable experience. It has such a great art style, characters, music, and especially gameplay. It's challenging, but really, really rewarding, and a lot of fun to go through. Every single area is so meticulously mapped out, and the gameplay complements those areas so well. The music and story are also just fantastic and I really enjoyed my time with this game. Another cyberpunk-esque action game that I played this year is Astral Chain, and Astral Chain really came out of left field for me. I wasn't expecting to love it quite as much as I do, I was expecting to maybe like it a little bit, but I really didn't expect the extent to which I enjoyed it. I initially played it for a couple of hours and dropped it for a few months thinking it wasn't great, I wouldn't come back to it. But I eventually did come back to it and I binged the entire rest of the game and I kinda loved it. It has its flaws of course, but I really liked Astral Chain and it has some great themes and characters and action and really just was a solid overall experience that I was not expecting. Some more action games that I played are the World Ends With You series. The first game I played on the DS, which is, in my opinion, the better way to play it rather than playing it on iOS or on the Switch, but really you can play it in any way. I personally really liked it. Its themes and art style were very pronounced and permeated through the entire game. I loved the characters and how they complemented those themes and the story overall spanning throughout the whole game. The sequel Neo The World Ends With You, which came out 
much, much later, just last year, I did not enjoy it nearly as much as the first game. Its story and themes were a bit more hard to understand and were not communicated very well. The character arcs were not as defined or realistic as they were in the first game, and I just did not feel much for many of the characters. The music was great, the art style in both of these games are fantastic, and that's really the strongest suit. But Neo, although it had amazing gameplay and feel, the story and characters did not live up to the first game for me. Also this year, I finished playing the Devil May Cry series, which I started last year by playing the first three games. This year, I played 4, 5, and the reboot, DMC Devil May Cry. First off, with 4, I enjoyed it. I really liked the new character, Nero, and how he played. In fact, he's one of my favorite characters in the series so far. The story was good, and it was a lot of fun throughout, but the repeated areas and somewhat boring sections did bring the game down a bit. Although I enjoyed a lot of it, it was still funny and had a lot of DMC charm. It was good. I enjoyed it. And then Devil May Cry 5, I loved. Easily my favorite in the series. The story really built upon the foundations that the first four games created and built upon it by making its own unique story that really did a great job at selling these characters and bringing them all together. It definitely felt like a finale to a saga that would bring in a new era for Devil May Cry. The action is the best it's ever been in the series. It was so, so much fun playing as all the different characters and seeing how they all play a little bit differently, but in their own really, really fun ways. I loved everything about the MC5, one of my favorites of all time. And then I played the reboot, which, despite having decent gameplay, tr it treated the series and the legacy horribly. The characters were done absolutely terribly. This is the definition of character assassination. They're nothing like what they are in the main series or really just as an idea. And that very much hurt me as a fan of this series. It was really sad to see how they did these characters so dirty and the decent gameplay really couldn't make up for it. However, some positives that I have about this game I enjoy the art style and areas and direction quite a bit. It's a very unique looking game and I really liked the feel of so many different areas. It was very surreal and unique and I love that aspect of it. Especially some of the bosses were really great too. Some of the best in the series honestly. But the story and characters really demolished any satisfaction I can truly gain from this game. Soon after I played DMC5, I played Metal Gear Rising Revengeance, which has gained a lot of popularity online in the past year. And especially playing DMC5 before this game, I had a lot of expectations going in with how popular it was and how great of an action game DMC was. And I'm going to be honest, I didn't enjoy Metal Gear Rising very much. The combat was simple and boring in a way. It was very mindless. And the characters weren't that interesting aside from pretty much just Raiden. A lot of the bosses only had a couple of lines and were not memorable at all. The areas in our style was not great, 
the art style especially, really just had that 2010s brown and gray look that I really don't like. And Metal Gear Rising just wasn't a very fun experience for me. I did not connect with any of the characters or themes of the game at all. The gameplay was mindless and boring, and the songs were okay. A few of the boss soundtracks were very good, but the area themes, the regular battle themes, did not stick with me at all. So Metal Gear Rising had potential to be great, but for me it really fumbled and dropped the ball on this entire experience. Moving away from action games, I also played quite a few visual novels this year. I finished the Professor Layton series, another series that I started last year by playing the first two games, and I played the other four this year. First, Unwound Future, the third game. Easily my favorite in the series. It had some great puzzles, fantastic music, great areas, the characters were so much fun. I loved the ending. I loved the emotional core of the game. It was overall a very, very strong, well-rounded experience. Then the start of the prequel trilogy, Last Spectre, was just alright. It felt a bit more like the first game, Curious Village, but it didn't have the atmosphere that that game had. A lot of that game was a bit more absurd and not as interesting or heartfelt as Unwound Future. I think Last Spectre came from a lot of high expectations with Unwound Future being so great, and it just couldn't live up to the legacy that that game had. And then the series made the transition to the 3DS with Miracle Mask, and it was a bit of a rough transition. Um, Miracle Mask was not the most enjoyable. The art style was just okay. Um, the puzzles were not great. I did not enjoy them very much. There was a really long section near the end of the game where you were like escaping from a temple. Or not escaping, but going into it really. Um, and I did not enjoy that section at all. It was not fun, and the characters were not that interesting or memorable to me. And Miracle Mask did not do as great for a first 3D game as I would hope. However, on the other hand, its sequel, Azran Legacy, was very good in my opinion. I loved all of the different areas that you went through throughout the game. The puzzles were pretty good. I liked the characters and how it wrapped up the finale of the series, tying it back to the first game. Azran Legacy delivered a strong emotional core with some good puzzles that I will say I enjoyed quite a bit. I consider this a game I played this year, despite it technically being a game that I played late last year, and that is the first I the Somnium Files game. This game has garnered a lot of popularity online, and a lot of fans of Uchikoshi really, really love the game. Of course, I'm a huge fan of Uchikoshi. I have played every single one of his games, and I have some opinions about I the Somnium Files. Um, I didn't enjoy it as much as others. Um, I still like it a lot. They're absolutely fantastic characters. I love the game, but it didn't hit me quite as hard as it did for a lot of other people, and as games in the Zero Escape series hit me. I will talk about this much more at a later date, but I the Somnium Files failed to deliver on a lot of fronts that made me love Uchikoshi and his games. And although I love 
the strong emotional core of this game and a lot of the characters. Many aspects fell flat for me and left me with an experience that I wish, I wish I could have loved a lot more. Still on the topic of Uchikoshi games, I played the entire Infinity series this year, starting with Never 7, then playing Ever 17, and finally finishing with Remember 11. Going into Never 7, I had very, very low expectations because it is quite a notorious game in the community, and it surprised me a little bit. I didn't love the game, but it wasn't nearly as bad as I was ex expecting it to be. It felt very cozy and fun in a lot of aspects. Although some of the writing was not very good, I had a fun time with it. I liked some of the characters, the music, some of the locations and ideas that the game presented. And overall, it was fine. It was not as bad as people have made it out to be. On the other hand, I had somewhat high expectations for Ever 17, because a lot of people love that game. And Ever 17, in my opinion, is my least favorite Uchikoshi game, and really my least favorite game that I played this year. I did not like a lot of this game, and it has some decent aspects about it, but overall, it is very, very flawed. The pacing felt very slow and dull, and I did not enjoy a lot of the story. The characters did not do much for me. The music and atmosphere also did not interest me very much at all. The ending twist was a little absurd, and I did not love this game. I really wish I could have liked Ever 17 more, but as it stands, I didn't like it. Though I ended with playing Remember 11, and after being so disappointed by Ever 17, I had somewhat low expectations, but still high hopes for Remember 11. And it delivered. Remember 11 has become one of my favorite gaming experiences of all time. It is one of the most creative and ingenious stories ever told in a video game. The characters are really fun and memorable, the locations are great, the twists are insane, and I love the entire story that runs throughout it. I can't say enough great things about Remember 11, and I do hope more people play it, because I really, really loved this game. Another semi-Uchi Koshi game that I played this year is World's End Club, and World's End Club is a collaboration game between Uchi Koshi and Kodoka, the creator of Danganronpa. And I don't love Danganronpa very much, so I had very mixed expectations going into this game, and I'd say that's about what it was. World's End Club is kind of just the definition of, it's alright. <laughs> some of the characters I like, some of the characters I don't like, the gameplay isn't very good, I like the art style and music, the ending was decent, the overall story was just okay, World's End Club left me with very mixed feelings, and I can't see myself really coming back to it, or loving it a ton. Another visual novel that I played this year is Ghost Trick. Ghost Trick was made by the same creator as Ace Attorney, another series that I dearly dearly love and I had also heard great things about Ghost Trick going in so I had fairly high expectations and don't come after me Ghost Trick fans but I didn't love it as much as I wanted to it was good no doubt 
The music, art style, characters are great. I loved a lot of this game. However, the pacing and gameplay definitely bogged it down a bit. The gameplay felt like a lot of trial and error, and wasn't very fun to me. The pacing was a bit slow at times, and the final twist wasn't that satisfying for me. It was just okay. Well, that's a bit harsh. I would say it, it was good. I liked Ghost Trick, but it wasn't as good as I would have hoped it would have been. Everyone knows I'm a big Zero Escape fan, and a big part of Zero Escape is the escape rooms. I've also done a lot of escape rooms in real life, and they are very enjoyable. So I figured it was only right for me to pick up Escape Simulator, a true core escape room experience. And there's no story, it's just pure escape rooms. And it was good. The presentation is clean and nice, I enjoy a lot of the escape rooms, and there isn't a ton to say about it other than that. Some aspects of it felt a little bit annoying at times, but overall, I liked it. It really felt like a solid escape room experience. I mentioned earlier that I played most of the Halo series with a very good friend of mine. But that wasn't all we played together, because we also played It Takes Two, the Game of the Year winner from last year, and I can really see why it won. It Takes Two was a very cute, heartfelt experience, and I loved the characters and story, but the gameplay really shined through here. The art style was fantastic, but again, all of the areas and gimmicks and platforming was just so seamless and flawless. It was a very fun experience throughout the entire playtime. Last year, I binged through the entire Metroid series. 2D Metroid, that is. I've only played Prime 1, and I might play the others before Prime 4 comes out, but last year I really focused on 2D Metroid. But that's not what I'm here to talk about, because last year, although I didn't get around to it this year, the newest 2D Metroid game came out, Metroid Dread. And Metroid Dread is one of my favorites in the series. Everything just flowed so well, the gameplay was a lot of fun, the bosses were great, the cinematics and story were really fun. And overall, Dread was just a great return to form for 2D Metroid, and a glorious return for the series. This year, I played a lot of games, and a lot of genres. But one genre I tried for the very first time this year is the skating genre, which I started by playing Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 1 and 2, which is a remaster of the first two Tony Hawk skating games. And as an introduction to this genre, there were fun, relaxing experiences that I enjoyed playing a lot. Um, I don't have a ton to say about these games, other than they were fun. I liked the challenges that they presented throughout. I wish the challenges weren't as required as they are, to progress, I wish I could just play a lot of the maps freely, do challenges if I wanted to, but not be forced to do challenges if I want to unlock new maps. Other than that gripe though, I had fun with Tony Hawk, and I might play more in the future. I tried a lot of new experiences this year, some that I wasn't exactly sure about. One of these games is Gris which is an indie 2D platformer, but the platforming elements aren't really emphasized. It's more about the storytelling and character that this game has. The themes of colors going throughout the entire game and weaving an emotional tale throughout. It was a very heartfelt story, 
and definitely got me to think a couple of times. But overall, Greece wasn't a very fun game to play, even though I know that's not the point. However, it being a 2D platformer, I expected a bit more from the gameplay, and I wish I could have liked it more, but Greece was a bit of a letdown in some areas. It wasn't bad, but it was just alright. I played quite a few relaxing indie games this year, as you'll see with this one and the next one. This one is a quaint little organizational game called Unpacking, and Unpacking features a very cute story of a girl growing up, and the story isn't told through direct dialogue or story beats, rather through journal entries and photos. I like this method of storytelling, although I do wish it was a bit more direct and had some other character inputs throughout. However, it is very solid and you get to really feel this character going through her life. The gameplay, while relaxing a lot of the time, can sometimes be frustrating when you don't want things to go the way that they go because sometimes you have a specific vision in mind or you try to put something somewhere and the game simply doesn't let you or doesn't allow you to progress without moving things around. And sometimes that can be a bit annoying and I wish I could have enjoyed some of the gameplay more but as it stands, unpacking was a cute, fun experience that didn't leave me with a lot of satisfaction, but left me with some. As I mentioned, multiple cute, relaxing indie games, and this one was probably my favorite of the bunch, which is A Short Hike. As the name suggests, it really is a short hike. It was very small in runtime and in scope, but was very interconnected and thought out. The world was very alive and fun to explore while just flapping around as a small bird. There's lots of unique little characters around and the art style is very very cute. I had a very fun time with a short hike and I do wish it was a little longer but as the name implies I wasn't exactly going to get that, so I didn't expect it to be long. Finally, a game that I've been playing throughout this entire year, and one that I've actually been meaning to get to for a while but didn't get to until this year, is Club Nintendo Picross for the 3DS. See, I've been a very big fan of Picross for a long time. I love the puzzle aspects, all of the art elements that go into it, and it's a very, very relaxing and sweet game that I love winding down with on an evening. Club Nintendo Picross, which is a Japanese-only game that was translated into English, has a ton of puzzles for many Nintendo games and characters and IPs. Which makes this game very enjoyable to play. I love all of the outcomes of the puzzles and it was solid. It uses the Picross E format, which is a very standard format across the 3DS, which is enjoyable and fine as it is, although it has its setbacks in many areas. As you can tell, I played a lot of games this year, and I don't know how I got around to them all, but I did. And those were all of the games that I thoroughly played this year. However, there are some that I have started but haven't finished, or a couple that I decided to just drop altogether. There's only a few of them, but I did want to mention them for the sake of this video being a complete experience of my 2022 gaming life. The only game that I really dropped this year 
is probably the most popular and well-known game that came out this year. Of course, I'm talking about Elden Ring. Elden Ring was a huge cultural phenomenon when it came out, and even still is today. It's one of the biggest open world games yet, and is a fantastic action game from FromSoft. Now, I've never been a big fan of FromSoft games in terms of Dark Souls, Demon Souls, Sekiro, anything like that. It's not a type of gameplay that I really enjoy all too much. And on top of that, I also don't really like open worlds that much. I know it's a bit of a sin, but I don't even really like The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild. And I'm a huge Zelda fan. It just didn't appeal to me very much. I played a good bit of Elden Ring, and by a good bit, I mean a small bit, considering 10 hours is a very small percentage of that game. But I played enough to feel that it just wasn't the type of game for me. I don't think I'll really be coming back to it, and I can acknowledge how well made the game is. I can acknowledge that the game is very good. It's just not a game that appeals to me. There's another game that came out this year that I wouldn't consider dropped, but I wouldn't consider currently playing. I'd more so say that this game is on hold, and that is Soul Hackers 2 from Atlas. I'm a big Shin Megami Tensei fan and Persona fan, and I really do like both of those series a lot. Soul Hackers 2 is a very unique, interesting game. I only played a small chunk of it, and I really enjoyed what I played, and I do want to continue it further, but it's just kind of gotten lost in everything that I've played this year, and hasn't really found its way back to me yet. I don't by any means consider dropping the game, anything like that. I do want to come back to it one day, but it's just not a top priority of mine right now. What I can say from what I did play, the gameplay is fun, however a little bit shallow. The exploration is just okay, but the main star here is the characters, which were really unique and interesting, every single one of them. I really enjoyed from what I played, and the aesthetic of the game is great too. I can't wait to continue it and eventually finish the game, but for right now, I'm just considering it on hold. I am currently playing through two games right now. The first of those is Cyberpunk 2077, which released almost two years ago, which sounds insane, but it is true. And I wanted to give the game some time to iron out a lot of the glitches and bugs that it had and get it to be a solid, smooth experience. I just started it about a month ago, and I'm really, really enjoying it. The story and characters are the biggest, most solid aspect here that I do enjoy a lot. They're memorable, it's fleshed out, I really like the world and everything in it. The gameplay is fun, Although it could use some work in some areas, especially the stealth, which I'm not a big fan of in this game. But it is very solid. The game is gorgeous. I mean, it is beautiful. And the soundtrack is incredible as well. There's an anime that came out earlier this year by Studio Trigger, a studio that I am a huge shale for. And I actually have not watched it yet because I wanted to finish the game before watching the show. So that is something that I will get around to eventually. But right now I'm playing the game and I'm enjoying it a lot. The final, final game on this list, the game that I'm currently playing through, is a classic visual novel. Not super old classic, but in the middle classic. It's Hotel Dusk Room 215 for the Nintendo DS. I've heard good things about this game, and it seems to be a good 
mystery visual novel. But so far, the game's been a little slow and a bit boring. I'm currently in chapter 4 out of 10, so it still has a lot of time to get good, but as it is at the current moment, it's not interesting me a whole lot. That could of course change very easily, but right now, I'm not super into it. I really like the art style, although the actual walking around sections could use a bit of work in terms of the graphics. I know the Nintendo DS is a very limited system, but it can look very crunchy and sometimes a bit bad. However, that's not a big detractor for me, especially with an old visual novel, and I definitely continue to play this game every so often, and I will finish it, and I'll probably talk about it, hopefully, if it's good, and that's about it. That is every single game that I've played this year throughout 2022. And that is my 2022 in gaming. I hope you watched this to the end. If you did, you really do have my absolute thanks. And please bear with me for the future as I continue to make more videos. Have a good one.